Hey, I'm Sarah Veseloff. <laughs> Come on, go. <laughs> we're, we're professional here. Welcome to Thunder Nerds. I'm Brian Hinton. <laughs> and I'm Frederick Philip Von Weiss. And thank you for consuming the uh -oh. Thunder Nerds, a conversation with the people behind the technology that love what they do. And do okay, tech okay, good. Right. Brian's having audio difficulties. Uh -oh. Ron, uh -oh. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what happened. Can you can you actually hear me? My whole like yeah. connection just went weird. Yeah, we hear you just fine. You're all yeah. good. Yeah. Hey, uh, speaking yeah. of doing tech good and Brian having technical difficulties, we want to thank our sponsor for the show. Uh, the whole year we have Pantheon.io. If you don't know Pantheon, they provide a platform for WordPress or Drupal 7, Drupal 8. They have a test dev and live environment. They have phenomenal support and they vet any kind of updates before you need to push them out. So they'll go through it, make sure everything's kosher. And then when you're ready, you can push it out without any kind of worry to your dev environment, to your test environment, way before you even get to the dev to make sure everything is working correctly. So thank you so much, Pantheon, for sponsoring us. Brian? I am having a bad day. Uh Okay. Sorry for all our listeners. I, my computer is just acting up. But uh, I, now I'm supposed to talk about this great thing called subscribing. So subscribe to the show. Uh, on YouTube, we have hundreds, hundreds of videos now, right, Frederick? Yes, and sir, if you do. subscribe, click the little wonderful notification bell icon. You can actually get notified when the videos are live and you can even come and watch the live show. Um, and also on your podcast player of choice, you can find us, search for us, subscribe, uh, and leave us a review on the platforms that you uh, enjoy. And I think we have an amazing guest today, right, Sarah? Sarah's um, nodding actually, quietly. I, we do yeah, have a yeah. great guest. <laughs> <laughs> Rocky start today. Yes. Hey, everyone. We have an amazing guest. so honored to have him back on the show. Uh, we have design strategist, UX leader, technologist, typographer, speaker, author, invited expert on the W3C web font working group, Jason Pimentel. Welcome to the show, Jason. Really appreciate you joining us. No, I'm, I'm really <laughs> happy to be back on the show. Thanks. Yeah, we spoke with you at an event apart just a few months ago, right? It was in Orlando, right? Um, yeah, yeah. That's it was cool. end of end of last year, so it's it's actually been a little while now. Oh, has it, man? Time just goes by. <laughs> I know. I still, I know. I still think like Christmas was like two weeks ago. Well, it it tends to go by in like big chunks in the spring and the fall. It's when like stuff gets really busy with conferences and stuff, and then all of a sudden the stuff mm -hmm. that you think was last week turns out to have been like last quarter. Oh, yeah. I, are you still uh, on the scene, if you will? Are you doing a lot of traveling? Are you doing a lot of speaking? Um, I actually just uh, I just got back from an event apart Chicago a few hours ago. <laughs> and um, oh, wow. and I leave on Sunday for Tokyo to go to A-Type I, which is a big um, uh, type and typography conference. And I'm teaching a workshop with Web Font Working Group has a, a meeting there and giving a talk. And... Um, and then it's off to Toronto for Web Unleashed, um, Edinburgh for Finch Front End, um, the RGD Design Thinkers Conference, and uh, AEA Denver in October, and then .css, no, wait a minute, Beyond Tellerand uh, in Berlin in November, and uh, .css in Paris in December. So, so slow, so slow years, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, for, I'm home for a whole three weeks October, so you know. Would you say uh, most of what you do is um, circulate the scene, providing uh, education, doing these talks? Well, it's certainly been a big part of it this year, and it was kind of um, a, a sort of a conscious decision on my part. Um, I mean, I left working for an agency a year ago to to do this. Um, to consult with companies on how to work with variable fonts, how to improve the, um, the, the way they use type in their sites and applications and, and how they uh, can represent their brand a little bit better. And, and so there's been a variety of projects doing that, some writing, um, and then um, 
a lot of conferences this year. People have been really interested um, doing a lot of workshops. Um, the one in Tokyo totally sold out. The one in Toronto is selling really well. Um, I'll be doing one in, in Berlin as well, as well. So it's it's really exciting just seeing the interest in typography really pick up. Yeah, that one in Tokyo looks super interesting. I read it was like their sixth year doing it and um, some very interesting guests. And obviously, uh, you know, since you're going to be there thus, um, how did you get involved with them? Um, well, it's, it, this, it's an interesting story, uh, at least to me anyway. Um, there, so uh, A-Type I has been around for 60 years. And, um, and so this is the organization that was originally founded in order to basically to try and protect the rights of type designers and type foundries um, early on in the publishing process. And they were having struggling with some issues with people copying fonts and um, shocker that still goes on, but uh, oddly enough it was happening in metal then. Um, and, and so over the years, uh, the conference has been a way for people to get together and discuss these issues, but also then present the things they've been researching. Um, so it's actually a very academically focused conference. Um, really very much about the history of type and type making, which is really kind of fascinating. And um, a, like three years ago, I uh, was working, doing some work with Monotype and, and they were interested in having me do a, a web typography workshop there. Um, so they kind of sponsored my going over to do the workshop. And that coincided with the introduction of variable fonts at that event in Warsaw. And uh, just kind of blew me away. And, and so I, um, I've been working to be more connected in the type world as well as the web design one. And so I've, I continuing to go back um, and do workshops and, and give talks. And then last year ended up getting elected to the A-Type I board. Um, so trying to bring the voice of, of the web and, um, and UX uh, design to the type world a little bit more. It's interesting too, how these realms are getting uh, combined and bleeding over and possibly within the future will dissipate into, it's just the same thing almost. Uh, print web. I, I remember when we last spoke, you were talking about a project that Adidas was working on where they were leveraging web fonts for print. And somebody made some kind of a module for them to use it with Illustrator and InDesign. And I think we're, we're probably going to see that kind of a trend more, would you say? I, I do. I do think so. And it's actually something I've been writing about a little bit recently um, for a client, just really looking at what what this holds for the industry, and 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 what Adidas was doing uh, is doing was really interesting in in using using the variable format of the type, and and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about what that is in just a little bit, um, in order to be able to customize what they were doing much more efficiently and and be much more true to the the designs of the type typefaces themselves. And, and that kind of ability to fine tune the work um, is really pretty revolutionary. Um, prior to that, there's been a lot of really butchering of the type forms themselves with horizontal scaling and, and twisting and pulling things. And, and if we can actually do it as part of the, the native format of the font itself, um, it's always gonna look better. And, and so, so there'll definitely be some evolution in print, I think in broadcast, um, I think there's just huge possibilities there being able to animate the type. Um, if you've seen the show Mind Hunters on Netflix, um, that, that title sequence they have, yeah, it's a fantastic show. Um, but that title sequence they have this season, in this second season, I don't remember if they did it in the first one, but that should be a variable font animation. I don't think it is, but like you could do that and you could do that on the web. Um, Michelle Barker actually, um, put out a code pen a couple weeks ago, um, animating the word breathing um, individually each letter, and uh, just using splitting JS. So it was really really cool. Um, but you know that's 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 how you could make something like that. And if you could render it directly into broadcast, um, that would be kind of unbelievable. But the software is just not there yet. So it's really on the web where we can really dig into the format and actually do some really interesting stuff. 
Did you say uh, splitting JS? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Didn't uh, Stephen Shaw uh, Shaw created that? I th I think so. Um, I'm kind of fuzzy on that. I know it's been a little while since I had first looked at it, and then then it just it came up again when um, uh, when Michelle posted that that pen, and it just kind of kind of blew me away. It's really good. She does a lot Maybe. of really good experiments. Oh yeah, absolutely. Maybe we could start off a little bit by talking on the points of value for variable fonts and uh, just um, a little bit of what that is. What is a variable font for some of the audience that might not know? Sure. Um, it's in, I'd actually be very curious if you do get feedback from your audience. So anybody who's watching this, um, tweet back to the show. Let us know if you've heard of variable fonts before. So I think it'd be really cool to do that. Um, I, what I, I try and do that every time I give a talk, just kind of take a pulse of the room and see how many people have heard of them. And, and at an event apart in Chicago this week, um, a, a good portion of the room had heard of them, but then you, know, you go to like push it to the next question of, is anybody actually doing something with them in production? And it was like me and like two other people. So it's, it's not something that um, has really made its way in um, out into the world enough yet. So so a variable font is, um, if you think about what standard fonts are these days, for every single weight or width of a typeface, you need a separate file. And so in order to you know, think of these in terms of print, um, when you install a, a typeface, you might be installing as many as 96 files for all these different widths and weights and italics and stuff. So there's a, technically that's how it's always had to, to be done a variable font is a new evolution of the font format that can contain all of the variations in these axes within a single file, or maybe two files if they split italics out into one and, and upright in, in the other. But regardless, one or two, um, you now have access from within the web browser in CSS to reach those extremes in the axes of width, weight, um, there might be slant in a sans serif typeface where it can go by degrees instead of just italic or off. Um, there are, there's the ability to have custom axes, which are, are really interesting. It's anything the type designer chooses to expose as something that can vary. And so uh, CJ Dunn has done um, his typeface Dunbar has an X height axis. And it, it really just changes the whole character of the typeface to like crank it up or crank it down and crank it all the way down. And it looks, you know, totally like art deco, um, bring it back up and, and widen it a little bit. And, and it's a much more modern looking face. So it's, it's really kind of interesting, the kinds of things you can do. And then there's lots of stuff that's much more whimsical um, or more detail oriented, like an axis for the height of ascenders and descenders. So that's kind of a neat one if you want to pack in a headline really tightly, uh, but you don't want the, the ascenders and descenders of the letters to collide, you can make them just a little bit shorter. And, and so you can get that densely packed type without getting the collisions in between the letter forms. And oh, wow. Just that whole point of the ascenders and the descenders. And for people that don't know type, that's like the little pits that stick up right. that ascend and the parts that descend below the line. Right, the, like the vertical parts of a B or a D or like the lower part of a G as it sinks down below the baseline of the text. And, and so things like that are really interesting, but the ones that people will see most will be weight and width. But even now, now is, oh, Scott, go yeah, ahead. Now, is there any negative to using variable font besides you know, browser support, obviously, compared to you know, normal font? Well, I, I, I think, well, I would, I would say no, no, there are none. <laughs> um, but the, <laughs> to be fair, um, that, that one variable font file will be a little bit bigger than a single static font file. But based on what I'm seeing in stuff going out into production, um, playing with it out in the wild, 100 to 150K seems to be roughly where most of them land. Um, if you're careful with subsetting, you can get it even lower. Um, I've seen some pretty solid ones come in in the 50 to 60K range. So it really depends on the complexity of the font 
and how many axes they're exposing um, and and then how many characters you have in there. So uh, if you think about if you've ever purchased type or made these uh, selection options on the Google fonts interface, choosing a character set like Latin one extended, as opposed to something that is sort of more pan European, it's fewer numbers of characters. So it's a smaller file. So if you're serving a site in English and you don't need Cyrillic characters, then it saves you some download. So there's a bunch of little tweaks that have to be made to make sure that you have only the, the characters that you need. Um, so then you will have a smaller total download because you're removing these other files that you're not going to be serving. Um, they will work in every shipping browser. Um, they won't work in IE 11, um, but you can use at supports to put them in production now. And then browsers that don't understand that will get whatever you decide as a, a fallback. So with stuff that I've done for the state of Georgia, it has fallback tuning for no web fonts. And then if you have IE 11, it will get static versions of source serif and Proxima Nova. And then if you have um, a browser that supports it, you'll get the variable version of source serif. And once it's released commercially, then um, the variable version of Proxima Nova. Um, which should be available sometime in the next month or two. And uh, there's a lot of um, tools within Firefox now that we could use to play with this, right? Yes, they, that is something that um, Jen Simmons pushed for relentlessly um, with the Firefox team. Um, there's an unbelievably talented designer that worked with her in designing the UI. Um, actually, you might've met her uh, last year and I think she... Nope, she was in Seattle. She wasn't in Orlando. But um, uh, uh, Victoria is really fantastic. Um, the tools themselves allow you to see everything about the at font face declaration. There's a little fonts panel when you open up the dev tools. And if it's a variable font, it will show you all the axes that are available and what the ranges are. And you can play with them right there in the browser. I mean, it's really, really remarkable. Um, they've, they've turned the Firefox dev tools into probably one of the best in browser design tools you could imagine, because you can make all these changes in there to tweak things. And then they're collecting the changes in a changes panel. And then you can copy all that right back into your project. It's, oh, it's, that's really nice. Oh, it's brilliant. It's just incredibly good stuff. And then there's the shape editor, the grid inspector, the Flexbox inspector, you know, all of those tools, um, they are at the moment, you know, kind of light years ahead of everybody else in the in what they support and allow you to do with CSS. And that was really their goal. That's the space that they wanted to carve out and own and, um, and they own it. That's so really good stuff. So besides the bandwidth, uh, depending, there really isn't any reason why we can't go ahead and start using this. As you said, we could use supports things like that to, um, to optimize for older browsers and right. have you. Yeah. And, and in terms of, and just to come back to that bandwidth question, I think it's important to reinforce that the whole point of using the variable font is to not have to load other stuff. So if you're only loading one weight of, of a font, then it's not really going to be a benefit for you. But if you wanted to do something like replace what you're using for a body copy, for example, um, you're probably loading at least four. Uh, so you're gonna be loading the regular, the bold, the italic, and the bold italic, and you can replace all of that with this one file. And, and so that's where in aggregate, then you see a net performance gain of less data and fewer requests. So there's, there's actually a substantial win that can be had there. And then once you have it, you have the whole range. And that's what it really is going to allow us to really stretch what we do as designers and, and do things that are more sophisticated than we've ever really been able to do. Um, we don't have to just stick with regular and bold. We can actually modulate the weight of the, of the font as the size changes. So if it's 700 weight at a larger size or maybe 900 and it's really, really bold when it gets physically smaller, that same weight is going to look harder to read. It's gonna be a little bit more closed up. So you could instead, as the size gets smaller, 
make the text just a little bit lighter. And it'll still have enough differentiation. It'll still be a little bolder than the body text around it, but it will be clearer and more legible. So, so there's little things like that. Um, you could animate the weight uh, in UI animations. So you could kind of pulse it a little bit. There's kind of, kind of neat things you could do there. Um, if you want to do a light or dark mode, because um, we have support for that with the media query, you could invert the contrast. And when you do so, you might want to make the text just a little bit bolder so it doesn't kind of fall apart against the, the dark background. Um, so there's lots of tiny little adjustments that we could make that would make everything else that we do that much better. Um, and then we can really kind of play with scale. Um, I love using a really light text, really big, you know, and like, and, and, and really be able to kind of play with those extremes. Um, you can get some really interesting effects that way. So do you have a, uh, a favorite uh, variable font? <laughs> well, thankfully there's <laughs> to be enough of them to, to have to like think really hard to make some choices. But um, I've, uh, I've been using Roslindale from David Jonathan Ross, uh, Font of the Month Club on my own site and in all of my talks for a while now, uh, well over a year. And, and I mean, I just think it's, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, and I do all of my talks now in HTML and CSS. So it's actually all in live web fonts in the browser showing people what they can do. Um, but there's, there's a lot of really cool ones coming out. And one of the ones that I, I worked with um, Monotype to showcase was FF Meta. And, and I just, I love that typeface. Um, I just, I think it's fantastic. And they now have a version of it with width and weight. Um, so you can really have a lot of fun designing with that. Um, but there's, there's a lot of really good ones coming. And then there's um, a really nice text face that I've been using from type together um, that uh, called Portata that is available in a, a variable format that um, I think is beautiful for text. And there's not that many text faces out there, nice serif text faces that are, are meant for long form reading. And um, I picked that one for another project that I'm working on right now. And, and I'm really excited to see that go live because I, I think it really looks great. Now, now you mentioned uh, a, a specific support in the, in a font. Do, can variable fonts only support in certain, certain aspects of what makes a variable font variable? Like, is there, well, I, I'm, I'm not very familiar with it. So no, that's, that's, that's okay. Yeah. Um, and what's important to, you know, I always try and reiterate with people when I'm talking about them is the axes that are exposed in a particular font are up to the type designer. It's not up to the browser. So there's no way that you can artificially distort it. The type designer decides I'm, mm -hmm. I'm giving you this range of weight from 100 to 900 or 250 to 700, um, whatever that range is going to be, that's what you can access. And then there might be another access for width, um, which could be only 75% to 100%, um, or it could be 75 to 140. It really depends on, on the designer. Um, the Adidas ones uh, are go, go massively wide. I mean, like two or 300%. Um, and that's, you know, that's just how they were designed to, to be able to work that way. Um, and, and so that's, you know, it's, it's up to the type designer to say, this is the design space. And that's, that's how we refer to it um, within which you have to work. It can be this, you know, here to here. Um, it can be this, this thickness to, to this. Um, it might have other characteristics. Um, optical size is a really interesting one, um, which is, uh, uh, a sort of a reinterpretation of something that was done in metal type for, for centuries where at a physically smaller size, there would be slightly less contrast between the thick and thin of the strokes. They'd be a little bit heavier so they don't fall apart when they print them. And then when it gets really big, you have much more fine detail. You can have much more exaggerated contrast. And so they brought back the idea of optical sizing and tied it to the font size at which it's displayed. So, you have an optical size value of 12 is geared towards when it is set at 0.75 M. And, and the browser is supposed to do that automatically. That's 
still kind of a work in progress in some of the browsers, but you can specify that number on your own using font variation settings for optical size and, and, and then match it up yourself. So with Roslindale on my site, if you look at the body copy, um, it's a little sturdier, um, a little bit wider. And then if you look at the headlines, you can see there's a much stronger contrast, uh, much more thick and thin and much more fine detail um, because I, I make the headings really, really big. So that's where the optical sizing comes into play there. It's just interesting because a lot of people probably don't understand or um, have been think about these challenges of, of, of that because it is a challenge and we've been trying to resolve that for years. But I think uh, a lot of us have been doing this one way and we don't realize that now we can do this or we might not even think about that challenge. We might think of, oh, that's just not a thing. So how do, how do we educate people on all these, um, all these different things that are so advantageous for us now? Well, there's, there's a few different ways. Um, I, uh, well, I write a weekly newsletter. People can subscribe to that. I talk about different aspects of web typography every week. Um, and I did three weeks in a row sort of diving into uh, variable fonts and the basics and um, what the axes are and how they work and how we might uh, and what kind of some of the crazy uh, fun ones might be. Um, so there's a lot to read there. Um, I put demos up on CodePen along with every, uh, every issue. So uh, there's lots of stuff for people to play with. And I link to a lot of open source fonts that people can play with as well. Um, so I'm, I'm working on it. Uh, and there are a few other people that work on stuff. Mandy Michael does tons of variable font demos on CodePen. She's fantastic. Um, she also created a website. I think it is, I'm going to double check. I want to make sure I get this right. Um, I think it's just variablefonts.dev, but let me check that out. Yes, variablefonts.dev. Um, so she's got a bunch of uh, content there and examples and stuff for people to play with and uh, and she'll be adding more all the time. So so there's a few of us that are are working on these sorts of things. And then there's, you know, of course, there's Zach Leatherman who does tons of incredible research on font loading performance. Um, so he always writes and uh, and puts out a bunch of really smart stuff there. Um, and, and I think that you'll see um, Google's working on adding support to vari for variable fonts and, and there will likely be some more educational content that comes along with that. Uh, can't really say anything else about that though. I, I imagine if, if Google takes that on, it's gonna be one of those things everybody goes, oh, okay, let, let, let's do this. And I, I, I also imagine that Google's doing that because of the bandwidth that they'll save. If they're serving so much with all these people downloading X amount of fonts, if they just are now downloading this one font for this one project, that's, you know, uh, instead of like three or four different versions of that font, that's going to save them a lot of, a lot of money. Right. Yeah. A, a summer or two ago, I think it's actually now going on almost two years ago. Um, we had a stat about that. Anybody want to venture a guess how many copies of Open Sans they serve a week? <laughs> oh, God. Don't worry, you're not going to guess. I can't imagine. It's yeah, 26, I can't imagine. <laughs> 20, 26 billion with a B. Wow. That, that was two years ago. So that like that's, um, I, don't, I don't know. And I, and I certainly hope that over time, we don't get totally overloaded by a single typeface all the time. But... Um, be that as it may, um, imagine that, you know, instead of three or four weights being served to all of these different people, like you're, you know, like you described, this is, that's the money. If they could serve one file and cut their bandwidth in half, that's, that's a whole lot of revenue that's not going out the door. Um, so there, there is a lot of incentive um, to make these things work and, and couple that with other evolutions in subsetting and doing some other things dynamically with the fonts at the server level. Um, and, and it really transforms every argument that we've ever had about performance and fonts. Um, they basically will just go away. Um, not completely, but, but so much so that it's certainly not going to be the topic of conversation that it is now. Speaking of that though, if we talk about the money, what about when, 
people bring this to market when they bring variable fonts fonts to market uh, opposed to just the regular fonts uh, is that it, currently is there like a higher charge for something like that because of all the value of all the work that someone probably yeah. puts into creating these variable fonts you're managing to hit on all the things that i want to yell at people about next week this is awesome oh, good good um, <laughs> so um so i i think i feel very strongly that this is the future of designing for the web uh, for many, many reasons. I mean, we haven't even touched upon a whole host of things about accessibility, about um, non-Western languages that will be improved with this. Um, there's, there's all kinds of things that uh, benefits that can come from this. The format was introduced by Microsoft, um, Apple, Adobe, and Google. And, and to date, um, we haven't really seen much else in terms of effort to really move the market forward from them. Um, I know that Google is doing some, some work right now, but, but I am a, a little frustrated. And, um, and so, so there's, when foundries are introducing it, pricing is another one of these, these challenges. Uh, there is some other history here in, in past precedent in attempts to create very, like some sort of variable font format. Um, there were attempts in the 90s at this, and, and a lot of people kind of got burned a little bit because the format never went anywhere. It's multiple masters and true type GX. But we didn't have the web. We do now. And that's where I think the biggest market is going to be for the foreseeable future with it. And so that's why I've kind of made it my mission to tell everybody on the web about this and get them really excited about all the things they can do. And that will in turn then create a greater demand with the type designer. Now, lots of type designers and foundries are starting to introduce them, but most of the time they're then charging the same price that they would charge for the full family. And that can be kind of expensive. So that, you know, that could be a few hundred, it could be a few thousand dollars. And, and for type buying for a branding agency, for a marketing department, they're used to spending the money. This is not necessarily a big deal. We're uh, many people on the web are not used to that being normal. So that's why they will tend to gravitate to something free. They don't realize that it's actually, it is expensive to create fonts. And so you do need to pay a little bit of money for them. Um, however, I think they're going about it totally the wrong way. And I know of at least one other major type design vendor um, who is going to take a very different approach. And I'm really hoping that's going to be public soon because it will put a lot of pressure on people to rethink this and not think about, can we convert everybody who buys two weights of this typeface to buying all 30? It's never going to happen. But if you can convert everybody to spending the equivalent of three or four, what would that do? You know, if you lose out on the high end of those sales, where are you going to be in, you know, net, if you could basically just convert everybody. And, and the reality is, I think once type designers are more familiar with working with the format, thinking about getting one file production ready instead of 32, it's going to save them some time. Now it's going to be a while before the market's really there, but they have to think about this in more than a six month horizon and see where are they going to take their workflow? Where are they going to take the financial model? And if you can start to get people more used to seeing the value, I mean, I think all of us could see the value in a font that's that versatile and think, okay, well, maybe spending a few hundred dollars on that is, is actually pretty worthwhile because I can do all of this great stuff. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I kind of feel that it's reasonable to charge a, a fair amount of money because it's, it's a font that, is incredibly flexible that can, you can reshape and re, I mean, especially in ones that, you know, support all the functionality where you can adjust pretty much anything. Uh, I, I can't see how, I mean, it's funny how where people see value, they see more value if they right. buy multiple, multiple, I'm buying more than one. <laughs> Wait, I'm only buying one, but this one can do everything. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Uh, I'm curious if, uh, I know there's ways of doing this without, um, well, I'll just get to the question. Um, 
font awesome and libraries like that exist and they utilize fonts. Are you familiar if anything along uh, the lines of uh, icons where the, the, the a variable icon weight and sizes and things like that are possible with um, variable fonts or, I mean, I know there's ways of doing it with SVGs and right. things like that, but. Um, well, it's, ab it's absolutely possible because it's just, it's just part of the font specification. So if you're using glyphs or font lab or whatever you're using to create them, then you can just as easily alter an icon as you can, uh, you can alter anything else. I think there still exists a real challenge from an accessibility standpoint with icon fonts. So it's it's not perfect because there's no fallback and there's no semantic meaning to them. So that's those are all challenges that you can overcome in one way or another, but but you can't really escape it entirely. Uh, but there is no reason that you can't do it. And and the format allows for glyph substitution too. So in theory, you could do even more than just altering the shape of it. You could actually swap things out and have an icon font that really does tailor itself to the size at which it's being used. So it certainly has potential. You I can see that being... The... <laughs> oh, I was just gonna make a witty comment on it. I can see that being funny as far as selling something. Like it's just one icon, but it's one icon that can be all the icons. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of value in something like that, yeah, if we yeah. could do something uh, like that along the lines. Um, you, you touched a little bit on accessibility with this. Jason, do you mind just going into what, what that looks like and uh, the, the extra value that it adds in, in that respect? Sure. So I think first and foremost, it's simply because we have such variability, I guess, guess that's the right word, um, it, you know, in how the, the typeface can be used, that you can get all of these extreme ranges of width and weight, there's even less reason to turn anything into a graphic. So you can get all these great effects with it and still have real text. That's a win. But there's a lot more to it than that. I think if you, you know, start to, to think through where are the challenges in with text and accessibility, um, some of those things are going to be, how do you make something that works well for someone with low vision? So you can expand contrast. And, so, and part of that is simply going to be color, but you might also use a grade axis. And the grade axis was something that was, was come up with um, a few years ago. And the idea is that it's sort of like making the type bolder, but you're not changing the metrics of space that it occupies. So it doesn't reflow, but... It, it sort of, well, you could think of it like a heavier grade of oil. That was kind of where the analogy came from. So we're going from like a, you know, a 530 to a 2050, you know, so that you can kind of expand that contrast between the text and the background behind it. Being able to do that by altering both the text and the color will give you a much stronger foreground background contrast. So you could serve users with low vision much better. And you also might employ some of those same techniques with light and dark modes. Now, a lot of us might think of that as simply a preference, but somebody who has issues with migraines, it might be a real lifesaver for them to be able to flip that contrast around with all their web content. Sarah. But you want to make sure. Um, you, <laughs> Sorry, I have um, chronic migraines, so very familiar with that problem. <laughs> gotcha. Well, and, and, and I, I won't profess to be an expert with... Um, what makes for the best reading environment. But that's one of the things that somebody had brought up was being able to reverse that, uh, but you still want it to be readable. So either playing with grade or the weight of the text um, is something that's a necessary component of putting light text on a dark background and, and to, to preserve the maximum readability. Um, so, so there's a few different aspects for, for accessibility that I think um, make a lot of sense with variable fonts. There's also, I mean, this is a little bit more of a stretch, but um, I've seen some variable fonts that, you know, just like you could vary the height of the descenders uh, and ascend ascenders and descenders, you could vary their shape. Now it's, it, there's research that's kind of gone, I think for and against the idea of can a typeface be better for someone with dyslexia, but I think the power is in giving the user the choice. So if, if you know, changing the angles of, 
um, you know, of the terminals is something that makes it easier for someone to take in the content then giving them the, ca the capacity to alter that themselves could make the web a much more readable place for a lot of people. So oh, if you don't mind me interjecting, ju just kind of like what you were talking about earlier, Jason, where you were saying some fonts are made for more long, long form reading. Maybe I could switch this font to where it's the same font, but I could switch it for long form reading, just something that's easier on my eyes for there, there's probably so many different scenarios, right? Well, I, I think we're just scratching the surface. I think we, you know, it's like trying to imagine all the apps that we have now when the iPhone was first released, you know, until the thing exists, sometimes you don't know how much you can do with it. But, um, you know, there's another, um, another really cool uh, thing that the underwear foundry is doing. Uh, these guys have come up with a way uh, the axis is in is it effectively time um, it's drawing in the characters which is just sort of novel in english but it's critical in chat in chinese the stroke order in drawing a chinese character is is integral to its meaning and so they've actually figured out a way that you could animate that character being drawn to actually create a writing tool with that something that can teach somebody how these characters are formed that's amazing. Right. I, I mean, I like that. And so it's, that's what I mean by like, we, have, we don't even have any idea how many applications there will be for these different variation axes, but there will be some really fun ones and really silly ones. We're sure. Um, but there are going to be some really profound things that can make the world more accessible to someone in a way that's just never been possible before. And, and that's, I think, really exciting. See now, now I want a, a a comics a variable comic sans sans or however you say it. Yeah. The variation <laughs> is that, that it doesn't look it like is. comic sans. What? No. <laughs> <laughs> Next, you're gonna want papyrus, right? <laughs> oh, get variable papyrus. Yeah. Well, I mean, the a avatar <laughs> the avatar movie might want it. Yeah. It just gets worse and worse. The different uh, <laughs> different things you can do with it. <laughs> you know, speaking of. Um, of fonts, we were talking a lot about technology. Uh, I, I, I saw a very interesting thing that you have in here about, um, or rather on your website, that type is the voice of your brand. And I think that's really important to explore because many people might not get that concept, Jason. Do you mind if we just kind of touch on that? Sure. Um, so that's um, that was kind of an extension of uh, a phrase that that came about sort of a few steps from uh, some quotes from some really wonderful people in the 1930s. Um, Beatrice Ward uh, said, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, that um, type is the clothes our words wear. And, and I think that that sort of gets at the heart of, of what I mean with all of this, which is that there's a tone that comes through with the shape of the letter forms and, and there, there are memories that get triggered with that. And there are associations with artistic styles. And, and so how we set this, whether it's, it's in a, a beautiful serif typeface or Comic Sans or Papyrus or something else says a lot about the content behind it. And, and so, well, you know, it, does, it makes for a good, a good metaphor. Um, however horrible an idea it is to make a variable version of it. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> but awesome. um, so you know so so if the if the text can can carry an emotional context with it the same holds true when you see that cursive script that writes out the word coke you know that as soon as you see it so so that is what i mean by like the voice of the brand is there is a, a their characteristics um you know and and, and that will call that brand to mind. And for many, many years, IBM used Bodoni as the serif typeface that the IBM logo was set in and in all their ads. And anybody that knew anything about type at all, as soon as they saw that, and I'm, I'm sure that lots of other people would do it unconsciously, that's what they would think about. Um, Apple did it with Garamond for a long time early on. And, and so we get these associations and and whether or not we hold true to it is 
a big part of whether or not that brand recognition is strengthened or diluted. So if you want, and that's why variable fonts can really come in handy where you can use that brand typeface and then use it in a wider variety of ways, but still maintain that voice. But I think what happens with a lot of companies is they, they use one weight of it, or maybe they don't even license it for use on the web. They go with, with mm. free ones. And I, I, I had a, a client say to me once um, in a, in a pitch meeting with them, we we're showing some different design ideas and, and this person responded, well, we don't have to use the same typeface here because that's our print identity. This is our, this is on the web. And, and I, and I couldn't really say it there, but I can say it now is that's, that's just wrong. You have one brand, you have one identity and either you strengthen it or you dilute it. It's going to be one or the other. It's, it's and, so funny. I've, I've heard that I, same argument yeah. before. Yeah, oh, I think I was actually, oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, please. No, I was just going to say like, I'm being curious from, from when we first introduced you and talked about doing consulting, my experience as a, as a, a designer and a UI developer has been that typography is kind of the last thing that, that anyone at a company thinks is important from, I mean, marketing to engineering to even sometimes the design department, you kind of get beat down to the point where you're like, okay, well, these are our two options to use on the web and, and this is it. So just curious how you work to really educate and help companies see the value. Cause this is a, I, I think it's a hard thing for, for non-designers to understand the importance of. Right. Well, I, you know, I think if you can have this conversation with people about voice <clears throat> and consistency and, and how you preserve the, and unify the experience that can help people start to see. But I think it's also about talking to the right people because in, in most cases, the people that are maintaining the brand would like everything to be consistent. They just don't know that it can be. Because when they go and ask somebody, the response might be from somebody in, in IT or, or in development that who, who don't want to load a lot of assets because they're rightly concerned about performance, um, that they might say it's not possible or it's not available. But I could guarantee you that virtually every typeface being sold today is available for use on the web. I mean, it's, it's almost a guarantee. So whatever, you know, whatever typefaces that are in use for the brand are probably available to use on the web. You just need to know where to look. So it's, it's going to be on fonts.com. It's going to be my fonts. It'll be from Adobe. Um, it's going to be from Huffler and company, but, but it will be available. And then the question is, you know, cost, um, traffic levels. I mean, like there are still some legitimate concerns if you are, well, and actually um, was, um, you know, this is a, a, a good example. Um, I met at, uh, at an event apart. I met the VP of design for the Wall Street Journal and they've, they, they don't necessarily have a limitless budget, but they certainly have a massive amount of traffic. And so that's where you start to have to make some decisions about weights of typefaces that you use. And, and, and I'm, you know, I'm speculating. I don't, I'm just, it's just newspapers are a good example. Um, yeah. But that's where you might run into some issues and say, well, we would love to preserve this. This is what we're doing in print. Um, we need to decide what is going to give us the greatest value. And once the market kind of sorts out the pricing stuff with the variable fonts, I think that stuff will tend to get easier. Um, well, what, yeah. one thing too, as, as we talk about this and as I think about it, and I think about, you know, my, my, my job and what we do with like setting design uh, patterns and, you know, building the, you know, the coins turn term now design system uh, with a font that can be everything. The complexity of that too, is, I could see being a factor where you're having to like, okay, I mean, we have issues now with uh, developers and that's one reason why Open Sans I think is used so, is it Sans or Sans? I hear I hear it pronounced both Sans. Ways. Uh, it's Sans. It's open Sans. Uh, open Sans. Uh, used everywhere. 
You do you. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah, thank you. Um how that's why we end up with that everywhere because of you know developers coding they're like oh, i'll just use this font even if the other one's defined but then if you have a, a variable font where oh use this variable font with these settings and then they you know don't set one of those settings it's another uh, difficulty like how do you well but uh, it's just font weight and font stretch i mean those are things you're already using but there is there's other other parameters with, that could exist depending on upon the true font. true. So but but how I do think, you address those? Yeah. Um, well, it's it's it would have to be in the style guide. I mean, and and that's where you know this is the kind of thing on in a in a in a good sort of idealized scenario, which may or may not exist. Um, the designer and the developer are working through this typographic system together in code so that you can see the sort of overall hierarchy that you're looking for. And then there are your parameters. We want these weights and this widths here and here. Um, this is what we want to do with optical sizing, if that's an option. Um, but there's, it's not really that different. Um, you're not changing the font family. Um, you're using fairly standard CSS font width, uh, font stretch uh, is an existing property. We just haven't really had a use for it before. Font weight works the same way. Um, italic or not, if it's oblique and has a degree angle that you can use, that's um, kind of the same thing as it's been before. Um, so it's as much as possible, it's been intended to be tied into existing ways of working. Um, so in theory, you could drop a variable font right into something and you know a variable version of of open sans might work like the static version of open sans and who would know um, but i see um, what you did there <laughs> that was really cool yeah, nice, nice uh bringing that back around <laughs> oh i'm 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 saving papyrus and comic sans for later i'll bring that one back <laughs> Please do. Yeah, so it's, it, excuse the pun, it's not a stretch that we could start to use these things. What? We could use these things at, and in a way that we already kind of know how to use them and we'll just kind of append uh, a little bit of new technology, new ways to do things here and there, but we'll, we, make... we basically are doing it. Yeah, there's your, it's a couple of small changes to the at font face declaration and and that may be it in some cases. I mean, and that's where, you know, I think getting people to just experiment with just bringing it in to replace what you're already using. There's a variable version of Roboto. Try bringing that in and dropping that in in place of the static version and see what you get. Play around with it um, and and then see what, what possibilities that opens up because that's where then once you you know, in a design system is kind of the easiest place to experiment because now you have these collections of components you can look at and start to, you know, tweak the levers a little bit. What happens if we shift the weight a little bit? Um, what if we start to do things like on really small breakpoints, make the body text just a little bit narrower? Uh, we'll fit a few more characters per line and, and we'll get a, a smoother rag on the right. There's tiny little things that we can do that extend it and design systems are actually the easiest place to play with it because that's where at least you know where to look where you're defining these things and you'll have fewer places to go and change it when you want to start to experiment i love that well jason we're getting really close to the end of the show and a question i love to ask and i ask this of every show and of every guest is uh, how do you detox? How do you, when you get away from the computer, what do you do? From my understanding, you you do a little bit of biking. Um, I do. Um, probably the thing that people know uh, the most for me is is the dog walks in the morning. Um, that's really important to me. Um, I've been. Uh, I mean, I've had dogs forever, but um, Tristan, uh, one of the collies that we have, has just turned eleven, and we've had him since he was four months old, and I've been walking him every morning his entire life. Um, we go over to Turner Reservoir and I will try and capture a good photo um, and just spend an hour with him walking over there. And then a couple of years ago, we adopted his cousin Tilly. And, and so now we have the two of them. And, and so that's, that's one of my main detoxes is to, is to just spend an hour 
looking at the herons that we see, or maybe it's fox or deer, um, kind of varies all the time, and just spend spend an hour offline. You know, the only thing that I'll do is try and capture a photo, and other than that, the phone stays in my pocket. Um, and I do ride a lot. Um, I used to race full time many years ago. Oh, and, really? Like a, yeah. like a, like around the world? Um, well, all over the U.S. I spent five years after high school just kind of traveling all over, racing um, on the road. And, um, and so I did that full time. Um, I sort of got close to being able to turn pro. I earned the points for a category one upgrade, which is sort of like the cat one is like the highest level of amateur. Um, and I got really burnt out and that's when I went to college and started doing web design. And, um, after about 10 years, I finally started to think it was fun again. Um, so I've been riding a lot lately. I've put a few thousand miles in this year and started to experiment with renting bikes when I travel, um, which has been really fun. So I um, I joined a, a club that has places where you can rent the bikes in different spots. And I rented one in Melbourne earlier this year and San Francisco and Berlin. Um, I rent one in Boulder. It's fun. I really like it. That's cool. Yeah, it's it's really important to have something like that to get away from the screen and recharge your batteries. Yeah, well, and, and I had a, a other really great experience this summer. Um, I was going to give a talk at CSS Camp in Barcelona, and it coincided with the week of my wife's and my anniversary. And so she came with me over to Barcelona, and then you know I only had to do the conference for one day, and then we had a whole week to enjoy the city. So it was nice to be able to combine those things. Oh, that's so awesome. Well, uh, Jason, we're, we're right at the end. I was wondering if you have any kind of uh, final words of wisdom, any kind of parting statements that you'd like to communicate sure. to the audience, whether that's something about fonts, variable fonts, or, or anything that you got that you want to uh, help people out, help, uh, help people get the, uh, the message of. Sure. Well, I, I mean, first and foremost, I want people to try it out. And, you know, so look, look, look me up on CodePen, um, look at the, the newsletter archive on, on my website, all the tips are there. Um, there's plenty of things to experiment with. And I think as soon as you start to play with it, you're going to get hooked. They're, they're really kind of amazing. Um, and that's, you know, that's really the heart of it. I want us to have a better web. I want us to design better. And I think that a lot of those things are going to start by, having these kinds of things in place. And, and I, you know, I, I want, you know, a year from now to, to have not just like three projects I can name that use variable fonts. I want there to be 50. I want there to be a hundred. I want there to be more than I can keep track of uh, because people are just having fun with it, um, doing great design, making the web faster and, you know, just getting us out of a, a bit of a design rut that I think that we're in um, that we've been in for, for a few years now, I think, it's taken time for us to get design systems under our belt. I think they're a necessary thing for us to do is an important step, but they're a foundation. They're not a finality. I mean, this is what's supposed to be in place for us to now go do great things on top of that design system and extend it and, and tweak it. And, you know, it's like with good graphic design, it's about knowing the rules and knowing when to break them. And that's when it starts to get interesting. So I'm really hoping that, um, that that's the phase that we're about to enter. And uh, I know I'm certainly going to try and do everything I can to help us get there. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. And where can people learn more about you and uh, what you're doing, Jason? The website is? Uh, the website is rwt.io, so responsive web typography. Um, there's the, the newsletter there at just slash newsletter. Um, there's typography tips under the tips section. That's where I've archived all of this stuff. You can see tons of experiments there. Um, on Twitter and GitHub and Instagram and everywhere else, it's just Jay Pomantel. And um, if you're coming to any of those events that I mentioned, Event Apart Denver, uh, Beyond Tellerand in Berlin, um, .css, uh, Web Unleashed is an awesome conference up in Toronto. It's a great developer event. Um, or if you're in Tokyo next week, say hi. I love it. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Jason, thank you so much for joining the show. Really appreciate you uh, spending some time with us and oh, uh, helping us learn a little bit about variable fonts. Thanks. I really enjoyed it. I'm, I'm glad I got the chance to be on again.
Yeah, yeah thank, thank you. you. And uh, for just to also mention all of our friends out there in Florida, we're we're also in Florida, but on the uh, yeah. on the what, east coast of Florida, we uh, we're we're thinking about you, and we hope everything goes well with the hurricane this weekend. So uh, uh, stay safe. Out. Yeah, be safe. Exactly. All right, everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Take care. See you next.